sister, I told you, had, had this coccidiomycosis. And when she came down with it, my mother lived in a, um, a senior's home thing. And uh, she was going to go up and visit. And I guess she told them that she had that. And then they weren't, they didn't know that she couldn't give it to anybody. But they didn't let her come until she provided all this documentation. <coughs> Uh, subcutaneous mycosis, that's where the infections beneath the skin and it's caused by uh, saprophytic fungi that live in the soil and on vegetation and you can get it if you're, let's say you're working in the garden and you puncture yourself or you're working with a thorn or you something that's in the dirt makes a wound and then you implant that spore at the same time into your uh, body, your spore or the hyphae. Uh, an example that gets spread this way is uh, a disease called sporopsychosis. Uh, it's a subcutaneous infection that infects uh, gardeners and farmers. picture of somebody that has a subcutaneous uh, fungal infection in their toe there. Cutaneous mycosis caused by dermatophytes. These are fungi that live only on the epidermis, the hair, and the nail. It secretes, this fungi secretes an enzyme called keratinase, and that then degrades the keratin that is in your hair, skin, or nail. And transmission is through direct contact, human to human, or animal to human. You can pick it up, and I picked this up. Um, you can pick it up by using showers. You know, and your feet are there. You can get them in your, you can get it in your nails, mainly your toenails, and I'm gonna show you a picture of a toenail. But these spores are around all the time. So normally you don't get it, but I had hiked down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back up again, and I, I, I kept sliding forward on the, my hiking shoes, you know, when we, we went down the steep trail. And uh, so when I came back, I took a shower in the common shower room that's on, up there. Yeah, and I got it. <coughs> so here's a picture of somebody that has it, and that this coloration there is where the fungi is in the nail. Very difficult to get rid of. Hmm. Oh, let's put that there. Ah. there. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, these are spores uh, of microform canis. It is a uh, organism that causes ringworm. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, and here, this is a pretty large ringworm. This is a ringworm. A ringworm is a fungi, it's not a worm. See how large that is? It's huge. Usually, I have ringworm things when I was a kid. <laughs> My mother said I dressed up in a clothes that a cat was living. Um, they're about an inch, or no, the size of a dime maybe. I'm, I had them all over my leg. Um, Superficial mycosis gets the fungi along your hair shafts and the surface of the epidermal cells. And this one is prevalent in the tropics. You know, it's humid. And when my daughter in law goes back to Korea, she always comes back with this fungus on her back. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one's easy to get rid of. Um, opportunistic pathogens, they're normally harmless. But it becomes pathogenic if you if it gets into a debilitated <coughs> somebody that is on antibiotic treatment or may have, have lung disease or immune disorder. So pneumocystis that is the leading cause of death in AIDS patients. And mycosis 
packet. That can be caused by uh, Rhizopus or by Mucor. Those are the genus of the fungi that can do this. Those can uh, infect patients that might have diabetes or leukemia or being treated with immunosuppressive drugs. <coughs> So a lot of times you're exposed to a lot of this stuff, but you're healthy enough, your body's healthy enough, and you don't have injuries, then your, your body fights it off. Um, also, uh, under opportunistic pathogen is uh, aspergillus, causes a disease called aspergillosis. It can infect uh, people that have lung disease or cancer who have uh, inhaled the spores. Cryptococcus and penicillium can be fatal to AIDS patients. And uh, yeast, yeast, some yeast infections are opportunistic also, such as can, candida albicans that can cause uh, candidiasis, and that can occur vaginally. If you're taking antibiotics, most women know that, taking antibiotics, then you better be eating yogurt to put back your bacteria because your the yeast in your and the bacteria live in harmony together. So if you get rid of one, the other one overgrows and you get like an infection and you get a yeast infection if you're taking antibiotics. Um, and or it can uh, appear as thrush and newborns are commonly can get uh, thrush. Their immune systems haven't been developed yet. Also, AIDS patients or patients that are on antibiotics can come down with the thrush too, and that is in your, usually in your mouth. <clears throat> now we have, um, well, it's in kingdom fungi as well, but it's called a lichen. <coughs> and a lichen is actually a combination of a green algae or a cyanobacterium and a fungus and they are growing together in a mutualistic relationship. They're both gonna benefit for us. So the algae, or the cyanobacterium, provides the nutrients because they're doing the photosynthesis. And the fungi provides the attachment. It has to hold fast that it's gonna to attach to either rocks or trees or buildings or whatever it wants to attach. And uh, also protects the algae from drying out. And from this uh, lichen, we get a compound called the erythrolipin, and that is used that as a dye that is used in uh, litmus paper. And litmus paper is what you use to check pH and dip the little paper in there and it changes color. Uh, lichen. They're used as uh, indicator organisms for air pollution. They can do that by chemical analysis. And um, also they use it by checking what species may be there or may be lacking. And some lichens, can if you touch them, they can cause an allergic contact dermatitis. There was a uh, probably before you were born, in 1986 in uh, Russia, there was the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and um, it was spewing this uh, radioactive cesium-137 in the air, and the lichen, <coughs> the lichen started to absorb this uh, cesium-137. And in Lapland, which isn't that far away from Russia, uh, they use reindeer as their food source, one of their food sources, their meat. And they had to destroy 70,000 reindeer uh, because of them eating the radioactive uh, lichen. Uh, <coughs> algae. Algae are unicellular or multicellular. They, you don't have to talk to them. Um, most of them are aquatic, but you find them in the soil, you can find them in trees, you can find them in the hairs of sloths in South America or polar bears. 
their photo autotrophs. That means they obtain energy from the sunlight and produce oxygen, and they do that through photosynthesis. So there's uh, several phyla of algae. One of them is called Phaophyta. That's the brown algae. This is the one that the kelp are in, the brown algae. They're macroscopic algae, and they're found in coastal waters. You probably, if you've gone down to the beach and seen these rubbery pieces of uh, seaweed, seen them before. And um, <coughs> algin is a gummy substance that's found in the cell walls, and we use that as a thickening agent in food, such as ice cream and in non-food items such as tires and hand lotion. So they uh, are using that algae to get that alpha for thickening agent. Here's a picture of a man, I think it's <laughs> probably South uh, Australia or something. Probably Australia. That's pretty big. They're huge. The kelp is pretty big. Rhodophyta, that is red algae. And they live down deeper in the ocean than the other algae do and they contribute to the formation of coral reefs. Now this is one that you need to know for a test question at some point. Your lab auger comes from that red algae that we harvest in the ocean. So lab auger and carrageenan come from red algae and they are both used as thickener, thickeners in foods and in pharmaceutical agents, and then we make our lab auger that Jan makes up for it from red algae. Here's a picture of a red algae. They have quite pretty little filaments just leaves and stuff like that. And they grow down low in the, uh, well, the ocean. Chlorophyta, that's green algae. It's usually microscopic both chlorophyll A and B, and it stores starch just like plants store starch. They believe that the chlorophyta, the green algae, gave rise to terrestrial plants. There's unicellular or multicellular uh, forms of algae, or chlorophyta, and they can also form filaments. Maybe you took uh, biology in high school and you saw spirogyra. <coughs> that is a filament of green algae. And uh, colony, maybe you saw colonies, or colon it's a colony of gold box, which is flagellated algae. This isn't spirogyra, but it is a filamentous uh, green algae. This one is zygonema. The chloroplasts are um, star-shaped. Bacill <laughs> the filariophyta are the diatoms. They are unicellular and they have cell walls of pectin and silica. And they fit together like one of your petri dishes. major algae and the phytoplankton. And some, uh, some of these diatoms can produce a toxin called the domoic uh, acid. And so that can be ingested by uh, muscles and clams. And it gets concentrated in the tissues of the muscles and clams. So if you were to eat one that had uh, ingested the domoic acid, you could get symptoms of diarrhea, memory loss, and they uh, now think that sometimes the brain damage may be permanent. In California, from this uh, uh, diatoms uh, toxin there, hundreds of marine birds and sea lions have died. Every once in a while you'll hear about all these sea lions 
washing up on the shore or birds and uh, many times it will be from just toxins. 